Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to this talk. Uh, this is Jason Eric Smith. Let's all thank him real quick for coming to talk with us. Yay. Hello. Uh, about 10, 12 years ago, Jason uh, sat in the same seats you were yep. sitting in. Um, so his path is something that you guys will be able to relate to. Um, a lot of these talks begin with somebody giving their resume about how they got straight A's at Stanford and got a job at NASA and no. all that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> this talk begins uh, in a bar in Isla Vista about 20 years ago uh, <laughs> when I was in graduate school and Jason was working at the bar and my friends and I would go watch football games there and we would chat and you know other than uh, being an Ohio State fan he seemed like a pretty nice guy so we would we would talk we had to a good him. run <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we would talk to him and, and hang out and uh, we'd talk about current events and things like that and eventually got onto a bar trivia team together yep. and I started to realize well this guy's got a, got a pretty good head on his shoulders that's kind of cool and then a couple years later he says yeah you know I'm getting out of the bar business and I'm gonna get back into school I said oh great good for you uh, what are you gonna go to school in?" he said physics and engineering. I said, wow, great, awesome. And uh, so the path begins and from there I will leave it to Jason to uh, take the rest of his career path through you for the next 10 minutes or so and then we'll start doing some back and forth with you guys. All right, thanks. So Jason, take the mic. Uh, so I, graduated, I went to school here starting in 2011 and I was taking high school level math and science, the pre-calc and algebra two was my first class here. Uh, the high school level chemistry class they had here in physics, that's what I took here, the trig-based physics. Uh, I ended up graduating from Sac State with a degree in electrical engineering uh, with an emphasis in control systems. Uh, so my talk might be centered uh, on my experience uh, with electrical engineering. There'll be some overlap with mechanical and computer engineering as well. Um, yeah, when I uh, first met Doug, I was uh, I just recently finished uh, UCSB with a degree in political science and law and society, which is a major they don't have there anymore. And I decided I wanted to stay in Santa Barbara. That was, I didn't care what I did. I wanted to party and have fun and meet women. That's what, that's what I did for all my 20s. Um, I wouldn't say I wasted my 20s, um, but I didn't develop any work skills. I was just having fun. But I met a lot of cool people. I met uh, Doug and all his friends. They were doing like postgraduate work at UCSB. There were people doing research in physics. They had these big giant laser labs and doing some really cool stuff in astronomy. And I developed this uh, like healthy respect for what they were doing. I would hang out with them. They would talk and just the confidence they had talking about some sort of logic based problem or math and science or whatever. And it fascinated me. And at some point, I started uh, looking at videos on YouTube about like theory of relativity. I, mean, I want to learn this stuff again. And I decided that, you know, I'm going to learn physics. And the last time I took physics was in high school. So I went to the library near my house and I grabbed the wrong book. Uh, I grabbed a college textbook, calc based physics textbook. I never took calculus before. I didn't know what it was. And I was, uh, I opened the book up and it was like gr literally Greek. You know, I, I did not understand it at all. And I thought, oh, I, you know what? I better learn physics or calculus. So I went uh, and found a calculus book and I realized that I forgot how to factor a polynomial. I couldn't do it. So I, I started with algebra one and I did geometry and I did algebra two in about a month from just the, the local library. And I was like, what, what am I doing? You know, I'm doing this for fun, but maybe I want some proof that I know it now. So I went to SBCC, did a walk-in, talked to a counselor and said, I want to go back to school and I'm not sure what my major is yet, but I know it's going to be in engineering or physics. And she was like, great. All right, welcome in. There, I was older, um, there is a reputation for older students to be more motivated, He's got a little more life experience. Um, so she's really excited, walked me through the whole process and I was enrolled in school and I started with Algebra 2, a high school algebra math class. And my first year and a half here was just doing remedial classes to build the framework or the, the foundation for learning physics learning chemistry and, and, and calculus and all that. I transferred in 2015 to Sac State. I already knew that I was not gonna go to a UC. You, you can't do a second bachelor's program 
As far as I know, you still can't. Maybe I think one school might offer it. I'm not really sure. But I knew I couldn't afford it either. So uh, I, I applied to a bunch of CSUs and uh, got into Sac State. It was near family. It was affordable. Uh, that's where I went. And I loved it. Uh, one of my favorite pieces of advice that I got when I was there was from one of my professors. And he said, amateurs practice until they get it right. Professionals practice until they can't get it wrong. And that's something you should all take into account. Uh, because you're all here for a reason. You're in this class for a reason. You don't, you don't join this class because you want to just get a degree. You're in this class because you want to get a STEM degree. All right? You could take any other class to fulfill what this class fulfills as a GE. So you're not here to just get the, the paper. You're here because you want a career in science or engineering in, in, in some form or another. So when I was here, I failed a couple classes. I failed linear algebra, and I failed calc three. I forget the, the course name. I think it's like 160 and 210 or something like that. I had to repeat those classes. And it's a good thing that you can repeat classes because for you guys, oh, you're young. You can make mistakes and it's not gonna hurt you. There's a bigger picture in mind. Don't get caught up with uh, the stress. Um, don't worry about, Oh, I got to get an A because I really have to go to UCSB. Just worry about that you're learning the material. You know? And if you fail, so what? Do you know how many employers uh, asked me about where I went to school um, when I started applying for jobs? Zero. Nobody cared. Nobody cared what my GPA was. Can I, can I jump in? Yeah. I got a good joke. Okay. What do you call an engineer with a 2.1 GPA? Employed. Employed. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. And, and I'm not. And I'm not saying blow it off. I'm not saying, well, you know what? Don't try. It's okay. Try as hard as you can. Strive to do as well as you can. But if you don't quite get there, maybe you have to repeat the class, or maybe you get a C and you, you're stuck with that grade. It's okay. In the bigger picture, it's okay because your goal is not to go to a four-year school. Your goal is to graduate from a four-year school and get a, a career in STEM. That's what, your, that's what your ultimate goal is. So little, little secret, well, it's not really a secret, but something that nobody really advertises, especially schools like MIT, UCSB, Berkeley. Whether you study math or science at the most prestigious school in the world or at SBCC, the math is not different. It's not magically harder at MIT. It's the same exact math. Anybody here, uh, I think Jamie Campbell's a math professor here still, right? Mm -hmm. He recommends MIT OpenCourseWare. Isn't it the same lecture that you're getting in his class too? For Calc 1, Calc 2, Calc 3, it's the same stuff. You know, so it, it does open doors. Doing well at a prestigious school will open doors for you that would not be open to me at Sac State. But two years after I graduate and I'm in the uh, professional world, those doors are not open to me. They don't, they don't care what my GPA was. They care that I was solving problems for a company and getting paid for it. So when I was here, and even at Sac State, and even now, there's something that, I think most, are you, most of you here first years, right? This is your first year. So you probably haven't really encountered this yet, but as you go through your uh, academic career, you will start looking around seeing your classmates that are really getting it. The material makes sense to them. And they explain it to you in a way that makes sense to you. But for some reason, you just, you just don't get it the, the first time you hear it. And you might start doubting yourself and you wondering if you belong. That, that's called imposter syndrome. There's actually a name for it. And, and there's a name for it because it's very common. Undergrads get it. Grad students get it. PhDs get it. Professional engineers. They all get it. And the thing is, nobody talks about it because you could be seen as a failure by talking about it. But I had it here. One of the things I did to address that was I found the smartest people in the class and that's who I studied with. Didn't always take, like I said, I had to repeat two classes, but in the end, I made it. I'm working in the tech capital of the world for a very fun company to work for on new technology. And I did that from starting here, transferring to a state school, and now I'm in the Bay. So it's, it's, and trust me, if I can do it, I guarantee you, I, you're all smarter than me. <laughs> I, swear to, I swear you are. You can all do it too. Don't freak out if you get a, a C. Just try harder, but accept the grade and move on. 
Something else, uh, there's nothing that says you can't study this material over the break. Christmas break, summer break, spring break, whatever. You have more uh, information available to you than I did 20 years ago. There's what, Khan Academy, there's any number of YouTube videos, there's Dr. Young's physics lectures. You, you could actually, this, you all probably know what you're gonna take next fall, right? For the most part, you have an idea. You know you can find that material online. You get a head start, you know, so when you go into the first day of lecture, you already have an idea of what you're gonna be studying. And it shouldn't matter to you going in, looking at this material and thinking, well, are they gonna cover that? I don't know, maybe I should skip that. Just study it all, you know, it doesn't matter. There's a very good chance that somebody in this class might come across uh, a math theorem that's like a thousand years old that no one's ever used before in a practical sense. And you're at some company and you're on this project with this team and you're running into a problem and you're like, you know what? I learned this weird math theorem like five years ago. It might work, you know? Just, just keep that in mind. When you go into the professional world, your employer is gonna trust you to solve problems and they don't care how you do it. You know, so embrace the academic uh, uh, journey. You know, learn things that are outside of your class. They might help you someday. And a lot of that stuff, actually, you will cover. When you go into your class, if you covered it over the summer, it makes it a lot easier to understand. It's a lot easier uh, on you for like your homework, your exams, to be exposed to that material uh, before you actually go in and have a professor tell you about it. Just a little, little piece of advice. I don't know. Do you guys have any questions about anything? I do, I do want to get into um, what you can expect uh, to graduate and what it's like to interview for a job, if you guys are curious about that, and what it's like to actually work as an engineer. That's something you guys I want to be curious about. So I think, I think yeah. I, we will do that second. I yeah. think our second section we had in the thing was, was for them to uh, start maybe just sure. okay. yeah. they're yeah. with you. Okay. And, then we, and then that was the third thing. It was right, that's right, okay, yeah. So, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, so um, I'm someone with a bachelor's degree from years ago in uh -huh. an unrelated field. You mentioned studying political science. Yep. Do you find anything of it, maybe just soft skills from a previous education helping you, or do you think it's a whole new slate? 100%. And here is where it helps you a lot, especially in tech. Um, I, in my first job, I'm on my second job now. In my first job, I was like two or three steps removed from the shareholders. It's like a big deal, you know, in your company. You gotta present to the shareholders. That's who you talk to, that's who you, you write. They're, they're ultimately gonna be filtered, all your stuff's gonna be filtered up through manager, manager, manager. Then the shareholders are gonna read what you did. You need to communicate clearly, consider your audience, you need to write well, take your, take your writing classes seriously. Uh, a, a lot of my classmates did not. And it was very, uh, there was a couple of group projects I had to work on my senior year. And it was very obvious that they didn't. And on my teams, I ended up having to shoulder the brunt of the writing. When you're working as an engineer or a scientist, I guarantee you almost every morning, you're writing emails. You're probably writing reports too. Um, there's a class here on public speaking Right? I, I think it actually ap applies as a GE also for UC and CSU. I recommend you take it. If you, if you have to fulfill that requirement, take a public speaking course. One of the biggest problems I ran into are people who don't speak well publicly uh, professional, in a professional setting. And you get a lot of these, these filler words like, um, uh, like, you know, I do it too sometimes, I forget. It makes it very hard to understand what they're trying to communicate. So you gotta remember, like when you're in school, it's okay to get partial credit, but when you're in the real world, you wanna make sure that who you're talking to understands exactly what you're saying. Uh, so yeah, it does help. Uh, oral presentations, written presentations, that helps a lot. So uh, I would recommend taking your writing courses seriously because they do come into play. And, and just yeah. to jump in, if everyone asks her questions nice and loud like she did, um, it comes through. Like right, I forgot. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. All right. All right. Good. Um, any other questions on the initial part of Jason's talk at this point? Because at this point, oh, yeah, we're keep going. Yeah. start opening up interactions yeah. with you, which is kind of what we're starting to do. Yeah. Yeah, this might link to the next section as well. 
But um, going into applying for schools and applying for jobs, is there something that, like as an introduction, to introduce yourself sort of as someone who's a returning student, or is that not necessary? Because I, I felt like applying for jobs, I feel I feel different than other people who have just done this one subject. Okay, yeah. So. You want to know if your age played a, uh, a, a, a part in my getting a job or not getting a job, maybe, or what pe how people treated me or saw me in school? Or like, is that something to bring up in a job interview, or is that something that... I, I typically don't bring it up, okay. or did not bring it up, I'll put it that way. Uh, when I was in school here, nobody commented on it, nobody cared. Uh, at Sac State, nobody cared. Uh, actually, at Sac State, I wasn't even the oldest engineering student. <laughs> you know, there was, a, there was a whole bunch of us who were like in our 30s and 40s. Uh, when I was applying for jobs, I, I don't want to call anybody out or say anything specifically, but I didn't have a, a robust tech work experience, but I had a lot of experience in work. So my resume had a lot of years of work on there. And I was applying for these entry-level jobs. Now, Chances are when you uh, submit a resume, it's going through uh, some software. It's gonna filter out the people they don't wanna talk to. You know, uh, well, they're not qualified. Chances are that's what it was. They're like, this person has all this unrelated experience, bartending and service industry, they're not, they can't help us. They kind of skip, they kind of filter me out. So for about three or four months after I graduated, I was not getting any callbacks. So I, re I removed my work history and only had my relevant, uh, uh, education on there and I started getting phone calls like hey uh, we saw your resume come up in our system uh, do you want to do an interview you know and I would start to tell them yeah you know I'm a returning student uh, da -da -da. sometimes they would ask me how do you feel about working for someone that's, that's younger than you you know they'd ask you those kind of questions I didn't always get a call back if I had an in-person interview I might get asked uh, where's your work history you know, and sometimes they might be just trying to do some mental math, like how old is this person? Um, but in the end, the companies that matter, the one that hires you, they don't care. So you might run into those pitfalls, but probably not. Most people in tech, you might hear the stories like Mark Zuckerberg says something like, once you're over 30, you're irrelevant kind of thing. Nobody really cares as long as you can get the work done. So, you know, you get, get your foot in the door, prove yourself. One, once you're in, you're in. Like I said, nobody cared where I went to school what my GPA was. They cared that I could solve problems. So yeah, you're, you're doing okay, you're doing fine. Yes? So, you kind of just mentioned that, so you kind of got rid of your previous work experiences. Yes. So, when you put down like your basic, and like I guess your studies in school, whatever. Um, so, were you looking to apply for jobs that um, like, like with your current education while you were in school. Uh, so you want to know if I was. Let's yeah. Do so you want to know if I was I was job hunting for engineering jobs while I was still yeah, in school? Yeah, and hoping to get a degree so that like you could, I guess, get ahead of the game before. You, you know, so a, a lot of people do that, and I think later on I'm going to talk to you about an internship program uh, with the company I work for. We're hiring in one of our interns. He's graduating in. He's at Cal Poly. I'm not sure. Do they graduate in June or May? He's graduating this this uh, this summer. We gave him an offer in November. So with the understanding that he's going to graduate, you, usually by your senior year, you know you're going to graduate. You know that they're they're ready to get you out of there and into the real world. So. Um, so definitely like apply. Of course, yeah. Uh, and I would also recommend for all of you, uh, if you don't have one yet, set up a LinkedIn account. Um, at each other, start networking. That's your network, all of you people. All right, get together. I would recommend uh, down the road when you are looking for jobs, if one of you gets an offer, share the information with your classmates. You, you're not gonna know your value in the workplace unless someone tells you, look at what I got offered. I got, I got this much money. So I'll, I'll tell you right now, for an electrical engineer in Sacramento, the starting salary is anywhere between sixty and like seventy-five thousand dollars a year, plus benefits. I think um, there were a few outliers. Some got up to like eighty, eighty-five um, in the Bay and in, in Sacramento. That I knew that because I had friends uh, that my classmates who shared with me that information. Because in your first or second interview, 
you're going to be asked, what is your salary expectation? And you don't want to undersell yourself because if you do, they'll be great, sold. We got this guy for half price, you know? So you do want to be aware of what the market is like. Uh, the other reason you want to set up a LinkedIn account is it's a great place to look for jobs. It has a, a pretty good job filter, but recruiters will look for you on there. They will filter out, say, we want a, we want a, a new grad. They went to, maybe they went to a certain school, but they don't really care that much. They just want someone who graduated for an entry-level position. Let's see who's out there. And you have on there that your, your um, status is actively looking for work, just graduated. You, you, hit, you hit their their metrics for hiring somebody. You can also see the ads for uh, who's hiring, what they're hiring for, and what they expect you to know. Because there's a lot of technology that you're not going to learn in school that they might be like, oh, you know what? We want someone who knows Altium. I don't, don't worry about it if you know what it is or not. But it's a, it's a, it's a CAD type software that electricals uh, use to design circuits. But they don't teach it in school but they might want someone to know it. They, they know you're not gonna know it, but it's a bonus if you do. So you can start looking now. You can look for internships on LinkedIn, entry level, by location, and just get an idea of what's out there. You know, so you, you got four or five years, or six in some cases, to learn skills that you don't learn in school that an employer might want. So yeah, go ahead, I would look now. Yeah. We, we got a hand online. Okay. Uh, Tanner, I don't know if, how well you can hear me. We're, we're getting some internet problems and it's laggy for people on Zoom. I'm very sorry about that. The recording should be better uh, if you end up watching again later. But Tanner, if you can unmute yourself and, and ask if that's possible. I hope. <laughs> yeah, his screen is frozen, so maybe he's not able to. What's going on? I'm so sorry, everybody online. I, I've been putting it in the chat for them, but. Can they, can they type on there too, maybe? They can, yeah. and the, the ch even the chat is coming in slow. So oh, okay. I, I think that basically uh, having this many people on a Zoom with this internet in this room is apparently... Well, okay. so we've got 25 on the, on the Zoom right now. Okay. And it, it, that's, I think when it started to, to, to not do so great. Um, so Tanner is not unfreezing. I'm sorry about that. Um, wondering if it's worth... Let's see, the recording is happening on the camera, so I might just end the Zoom and restart. Now then everybody's going to have to rejoin. You, you know what? Is this going to be posted somewhere where... Yeah, I'm going to put a, put a YouTube video up. Uh, if, if you can't get a question in right now, uh, put it in the comments of the YouTube video, and I will try to remember to check and see if I can help you that way. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. yeah I'm getting tons of, of comments about how it's glitching and... Um, it was going better earlier, but there was there was fewer people in here, so I think it's. Uh, um, Maybe we can put yeah. something in the header also of the title or the whatever on the YouTube. Be like, hey, ask a question here. I'll, I'll try to get to it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I will. I will type. I will type that in. I think. I think for right now we're going to have to focus on the in-person people's questions. Okay. Anybody um, have? Yeah. What, what, one other thing I wanted to invite, in, in not just questions that you have for Jason, but if you have particular challenges that you or your classmates are facing. Um, to go ahead and bring those up because Jason faced a lot of challenges through his time here, as right. I already mentioned, yeah. and he may have specific ones that are similar to the ones that you're bringing up. And uh, if you have those, and say, how do you how do you get over this, um, or or does this kind of thing end your situation? So already talked about failing classes, right? So that's one common one. Um, so please do bring those up as well. But if you have other questions like the ones you're asking, please keep going. Um, I'm going to type to the people on, on Zoom and yes. see if I can help. So I'm not really interested in going to like a four year and getting a bachelor's I've been so I've been mm -hmm. coming here to SBCC for quite some years already and I've been working in a different field of, and so my original when I started coming here was engineering you know and so I took a bunch of uh, science and math right. and stuff I left for quite some years came back finally and I I'm very close to a few associates I want to just get those and go into software would that be so you want to you get an AS degree in computer science or IT? No, in engineering, because I'm very close to one in engineering and one in math. Got it, OK. Yeah. Uh, but, you, but you might want a career in computer science, yeah. is what you're thinking. OK, so if I remember correctly, and I could be wrong about this, if you study uh, engineering, uh, if you get an AS degree in engineering, I think by default, you also get math and science, and science or, physics and science, or physics and math also. Is that correct? Math for sure. Math for sure? Yeah. Okay. You need, chem. you need two years of chem for the physics. 
Right, but, it, but I think if you're doing electrical or, or, or mechanical, I think you- I only do one. You only do one? Okay, okay. Uh, the thing about computer science, and this actually is just like uh, engineering in general too, if you can do the work, they'll hire you. So, do you already have like a GitHub and you got code on there and that kind of yeah, stuff? I, on my own, yeah. I learned Python and started to learn a bunch about computers. I'm learning Python right now too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I finished this whole project of it and like, I mean, it's not like a crazy project, but yeah. Right. I Python and, started to and, and and what you're currently doing for work is it's is, is it tech related? So no, I was actually in um, construction. Okay. I was I was construction painting, so I was doing that. I mean, the only thing I can, I guess, kind of. I think uh, combined with that is a problem um, solving aspect. Here. You could, yeah. I mean, the thing, the thing is, uh, so you, you could, if if you know any kind of program well enough, program computer language, you can apply it to almost any problem, right? I mean, that's what we have these like these like psych, uh, psychology based uh, programs to like get you to buy more stuff. You know, who would have thought of that? Um, the interesting thing about uh, computer programming, at least from my uh, perception of it uh, as an electrical engineer is a lot of times I'll look at a company and they'll say, hey, uh, it'd be a bonus if you knew Python or C or MATLAB. It's true, a, a lot of companies want their uh, engineers to know these computer languages, but usually how it started was there was some engineer on some team who had a problem and they're like, you know, I bet you we could save like a week if we wrote a problem, uh, wrote a c computer script that would uh, process this data quicker. And the person might think, you know, I know Python, I'll use Python to do this. And so they'll write a Python script to solve this problem. Well, you wanna have some redundancy there, so you're gonna have like maybe a, a second person, hey, learn this, learn this script, learn how to use a script. So you're gonna have two people now that have to learn Python. Maybe nobody else in the company knows Python. But now, the CTO is like, you know what? We want to hire some new people that know Py Python. So a lot of times, it's just, I, I wouldn't say it's selfish, it's just that like someone took an easy road because, road because they knew this language. A lot of times that's how it ends up being a uh, company policy that their new hires have to know a certain language. You, you actually might come across, if you guys set up a LinkedIn account and you look at jobs, you might come across somebody trying to hire a consultant who knows Fortran. Anybody know what Fortran is? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's what they used, oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's what they used to like launch the space, sh uh, the space shuttle back in like 69. <laughs> I think it was Fortran, right? Or Cobalt or whatever. Yeah, there's actually a very small uh, uh, market for retired engineers that know these languages. And, they, and the reason they know is because their employees from 30 years ago knew it. And they had to hire someone who had to know that language too. And then they, they, taught, they taught their new uh, employees that too. Now obviously they're, they, they gotta hire these consultants to like convert it from Fortran to like you know, C or MATLAB or whatever they're gonna do. And they need the person to say, well, what does this mean? What does this do? You know. So yeah, if you have a like a kind of a robust uh, resume of your own work, uh, it helps. You know, and you're kind of worried that like you're gonna jump in with this AS degree, and you maybe you might uh, be lost in the in the mix of bachelor's degrees. Yeah. Right. So I kind of from what I wanted to do was I heard that you can get like certificates in the yes, like, yeah, and you can and you can put them on your resume, and almost every employer now use a software. No one's gonna actually physically read your resume until it goes through this filter. Mm -hmm. And so if you have like, yeah, I got, I'm Microsoft certified in this and you know, whatever all the, the computer science type stuff is, it'll go through uh, this filter and say, yeah, he knows this, this, and this. Okay, let's give him a phone call. You know, uh, so yeah, there's, my grandfather uh, never went to college and he's an electrical engineer and he invented things that are used on the space shuttle. Uh, one of his inventions, um, still used today, uh, cuts the time it takes to change an airplane engine in half. Almost every plane in the world uses this now. Um, and he learned it all in the military. Uh, and when he went to go work, they didn't ask him where he went to school, they asked him what can you do? Because he has the experience. So yeah, if you can get your, door, your foot in somewhere, yeah, do it. You know, um, don't don't be worried about not having a bachelor's degree. You know, because once you get in, like I said, once you get in, you're in until you want to leave. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Um, going back to languages, is there one that you encounter more in the field, or that you would think uh, is more valuable to learn? So you want to know if there's a language that's maybe more pervasive than other ones yeah. as an electrical engineer. To be honest with you, uh, in the two jobs that I have. 
I have had so far, I kind of avoided computer programming. And so uh, in my, my first job, I was an electrical test engineer for a power electronics company. And we only had to know how to use one Python script that somebody wrote two years earlier to automate this test that ran overnight. That was it. I just had to know how to like start this program and run it and leave. And every other engineer in the building did the same thing. The only person that knew how to write, this, write in Python was this one person from two years ago who left. <laughs> that was it. Um, but it's helpful because if I had known Python, I could have maybe written a test script that could automate other processes. When I went to uh, my new company, Bloom Energy, and now I have to know Python because my, this team that I work with in parallel, they write in Python. So I have to know it too because I need to write scripts that are working parallel with their scripts. So I'm, I'm like crash course learning it right now. You know, uh, what, actually what really helps is having the experience of how to uh, format uh, a, a, a script. You know, they're all kind of the same, right? Like there's a while loop, a for loop, uh, you know, if else. It's the syntax is a little bit different. So, but if I were to say that there's one that you should focus on, I would probably say Python. It's a very high-level language. It's I'm told it's easy to learn. I know a little bit. Yeah, I would say that I, I'm having trouble with it because I'm just not that great at programming. It, it, even even the, the CS guys at where I work at say, just try to find someone to do that for you when I'm still trying to learn it. Yes? What about MATLAB? Yes, MATLAB actually, and it, like I said, like, when you set up a, a LinkedIn account and you look for a job, or Indeed, Monster, whatever, you will see MATLAB, C, Python. I, I'm not saying that there's going to be like one more than another. Again, if you know a language, put it on your resume. You know, when you're when you go to work and you're in the the, the private sector, and you know how to use uh, MATLAB and how to apply it to a problem, you just made MATLAB a requirement for people in your company to learn. You know, so yeah, it is helpful to learn it. it, it uh, MATLAB's still taught here, right? Yeah. Is yeah. So I actually still have my. Uh, um, Materials from that class. I can't. Who? Steve. No, no, he, I think he went to sabbatical. Oh, okay. Yeah. He's a new teacher this year. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I still have the. Uh, there was a this orange printout booklet that has shortcuts of all the stuff. You, yeah. I still have that. You know, I haven't used it professionally, but I might someday. So I keep my. I keep my books. I keep my stuff. As far as the coding language, like for a question. Yes. What I've known as Python has become one of the probably, I think, the most popular one that's being used right now. It, it is, and the reason why is because it's considered easy. Yeah, it's yeah. easy for the, and from what I know, it's easy for the reason, like, computers and phones you see are, like, more, um, well, the, the, it, it requires a lot more syntax. Right. And, but apparently the reason the syn it works much better is it's very, very, very clear as to what it's going to do, whereas right. on it has, it can be used um, kind of as an add-on to, like, the C. So, like, right. I, written in C and then Python is, used to like right. the functions, I guess you could say. Yeah, so that, that's actually above my head. <laughs> so, you know, like I said, like, I, I sometimes I will, uh, in here to do something I'm not qualified for yet, but I'm just gonna learn on the fly, yeah. you know, how I go. But yeah, py yeah Python is pretty ubiquitous uh, in Silicon Valley. And I, I think the reason why is because it's very easy to learn. Yeah. Uh, and you, like you said, yeah, it's, it's exactly, <laughs> yeah. You don't know. Right, it's very intuitive. Right, so if you don't know it, you can kind of pick up what's going on with that language. Yeah. And the yep. syntax is very easy. Is another like big. Plus right. What I've heard, like and, I mean, from my experiences, right. Much easier. And, and what's great also is a lot of the stuff you can learn from YouTube. It's free. Where I learned it. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Um, so just wondering, you mentioned um, like networking on on LinkedIn and everything. Mm -hmm. So this might be the answer, but I, I've been in situations before in, in another field where I was applying to like hundreds of jobs on Indeed and getting nothing. Are you for the more traditional, kind of meet someone in person and talk to people, or is it still a good, do you still get all your jobs online, or? Yes, yeah, so you, you still, so I, I talked to my parents about this, right? So back in the 80s, you would mail your resume, you know, to a, a giant building that had like 8,000 employees, you know, and you would hope you get a call back. Uh, now it's all, almost all automated, you, you, everything's online. Doesn't have to be, uh, you know, who you know helps, you know, that can get you your foot in the door. But uh, uh, yeah, it's pretty much online. The personality part comes later. And we can actually go through a whole interview, like what it's like.
And I'll, I'll tell you, because they actually, they do want to fill you out. They want to know who are you as a person. Not necessarily you qualified, but are you gonna be a good team player with the rest of your team kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Critical. It's true, yeah. I'm getting, I'm getting feedback from, uh, we got the Zoom doing better. Oh, good. But they do want you to repeat the questions. Oh, right, uh, so. Uh, I, I, a couple of them they heard, a couple of them they didn't. Yeah, hear, so, so. so for the, that last question had to do with, uh, uh, how you would look for a job. Uh, is it more uh, in person, mailing off resumes? Is it online, it's a little more digital? It's almost exclusively digital. If you're gonna go into tech, they're gonna use tech to find you. So you, you wanna have a, a good resume that uh, goes through their filters. A cover letter actually helps. Here's an example of how a cover letter opened a door for me. I didn't get the job, but it got me in the door where I shouldn't have been. So. I'll explain a little bit about what it takes to graduate. You have to do this like senior design thesis. You find a problem in society, and you need to come up with a solution, an engineering solution to it. And mine was, uh, my team actually was, we designed and built a robot that would facilitate pollination in strawberry plants. Really, really for any kind of crop that was self-pollinating, but we chose strawberry plants. And there's a reason why we chose self-pollinating, it's a lot easier. Uh, for those of you who are going to electrical, computer, mechanical, when you get to this point in your career, uh, career in academics, avoid drones, all right? Avoid drones, all right? You're talking about a precision there that you can't do yet. We chose a land-based wheeled robot that, that's why, that's why we chose self-pollinating crops. I developed this uh, interest in agriculture because of this. I wanted to uh, maybe start a company that would uh, help farmers uh, save some money on the front end before they sell off to some distributor somewhere. And this is our idea, was to save money from them having to rent and import bees. Uh, apparently in California, half the bees in California are imported from other parts of the, the US. So I came across a job uh, on LinkedIn. It's a French robotics company that um, has a robot that does weeding for vineyards. And they had an opening in Salinas. And I'm all, that's what I want to do. I want to build robots that help farmers. So I already had this kind of cover, like generic template, like form letter, cover letter, that said, hey, I'm Jason, I love engineering. Um, you kind of want to let it kind of be a little different from your resume. They see your resume, have something that kind of helps you stand out. My cover letter did not stand out. But my rewrite for, for agriculture did stand out. And it got me into a job interview I shouldn't have been in. They wanted an experienced electrical engineer and they saw my passion come through in the uh, letter. And it got me two interviews, one with this French company, one with a company uh, in kind of the farming, Central California area. I didn't get either job because I didn't deserve to be in the room, but they liked that I had the passion for it. So a cover letter actually helps. It'll open some doors for you that might, one or two that might not be there before. If nothing else, you're all gonna need practice interviewing. And the best practice is actually going to a company and talking to an engineer or an HR person and get a, and get a feel for it. Yes. Uh, so I think we've got a, a good amount on um, applying for jobs and that whole process. Yeah. Uh, Tanner on the Zoom had a question about a little earlier in the process okay. about transferring to schools. And I, I don't remember the whole thing, Tanner, it's not in the other chat, but um, uh, it was about what happens if you don't get into all of your schools that you're applying to. Uh, and I, can you uh, speak about the specific advice you were looking for? He's about to unmute. Okay. There you go. Yeah, so I was basically just asking um, what advice do you have to us engineering or science students that we're going to go through this whole course load and it's a lot of work and I think a lot of us are terrified that we'll go through all of this, um, do everything we need to do, and there's a good chance we won't get it into any of the schools we want. And what would be your advice from there? Because I imagine a lot of students that they're lost or that they did this for nothing or that there was a better route or something like that, you know? Uh, so the question is, what if I don't get into the, my school of choice, right? The, uh, or you really want to go to this, this uh, you're, a, I'm guessing, a comp sci major. You really want to go to Carnegie Mellon, right? That's, you want to get in and you want to be a computer programmer. But you didn't get in there, but you got into Long Beach State. Um, I'm not putting down Long Beach State at all. Um, I'm just saying that the prestige there is different, right? There's, there's a public perception of uh, schools that's well-deserved, but like I said earlier, uh, in the end, 
your goal is not to get into UCSB or Berkeley, right? Your goal is to graduate and get a career in tech, right? That's, that's your ultimate goal. Don't worry uh, uh, so much about not getting into your school of choice. Yeah, it might open some doors for you, but I'm guessing you're probably in your late teens, early 20s. You got plenty of time to develop a robust resume that will get you into Google or at, wherever you want to go, Apple. Uh, like I said earlier, not one employer, when I, in my, this last round of interviews I did, not one employer asked me where I went to school or what my GPA was. They asked me, give me a ballpark problem that you solve your last job. That, they care about if you can do the work. They don't care uh, about you, you going to UCLA. I'll put it that way. So uh, yeah, I understand the stress. It was different for me. I was a little more mature and I already knew I don't want to go to a UC. I can't afford it. I already know that my plan is to go to a CSU. Um, but for somebody in, in, your, in your guys' position, you might, you want to go to UCSB. I get it, you're here because you probably want to go to UCSB, right? Or Cal Poly. You want to go to school in the Central Coast, right? To a very good science tech school. I understand it, but in, in the end, that's not your ultimate goal, right? Your ultimate goal is what happens after. Yeah. I'll add that it's, it's in those schools' interests to sell you this image that you right. need to go to UCLA, you need to go to Stanford or Berkeley in order to get where you're going because it keeps their prestige up. And for some other majors, that might be true. Uh, but for engineering, physics, computer science, I think what Jason's right. saying is absolutely true. Just, just build your portfolio, build your resume, build your skill set, and you can get where you need to go without without bouncing through those highly competitive windows. And it may be it may be you know a family pressure or or just your self pressure to try to be in that elite class. Um, what I found younger and I was quite surprised as I as I moved on is it's really not that important. It, it it's going to be up to you and what you do with your work at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, it may take an extra year or two to get where you're going, but it's going to get you there if, if you're doing the right things. Yeah, keep, keep in mind that these schools, they want 45,000 people to apply. They already know they're going to take 800, but the lower their acceptance rate, the, the more their prestige is. You know, the, that's, that's going to make them a top school because they're very selective in who they take. So they're going to encourage you to apply. It, it's not, it's not a, a bad thing. I'm not saying they're doing anything underhanded, um, but it's just part of the, it's part of the game. You know, they want that ranking, you know, uh, as a as an individual, you know, dean or somebody in the school, they want to be the dean of the top engineering school, the top computer science school. You know, they want to build part of building it is building the prestige, you know. But in the end, when you go to a job and you're free, it's true. There are a few employers that will care about GPA. Uh, if you go into the defense industry, that might be an issue. I have no desire to work in defense, so I didn't care. I didn't apply to Raytheon. I, am I, is that bad to say that on a video? Like, I, 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 look, they're not a bad company. I'm just saying I don't want to work in defense. You can say anything you want. Okay, uh, so I think there was one company that I, did, I think had a GPA requirement uh, that I wanted to go work for because it was near family in Austin, Texas, and it was AMD, you know, the chip manufacturer. They wanted a 3.0. I have a 2.9. That was my graduating GPA. I couldn't apply. I would have gotten filtered out, so I didn't. But for the most part, if I wanted to apply to AMD right now, I, they, if I sent them my resume, they'd call me the next day. Because I have two years under my belt. Just two years, that's all it took. So I got so. a very good timely question here from the chat because this is probably where I wanted to move next anyway. Uh, any tips on internships and research as an undergraduate with not much work experience in the field? Which okay. Which is something you wanted to talk about particularly, but also right. in general. All right, so uh, I work for a company called Bloom Energy. Uh, Bloom Energy is a green energy company. We make hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, our, our goal is essentially to like power every house and company in the world with clean hydrogen energy. Um, I asked my director of engineering about two weeks ago uh, about our internship program, and it turns out it's very robust. Okay, so I, it, he wasn't sure about the number, but I think last summer we took 60 interns last summer. And I asked him specifically, are these first year, second year, or third year? He said everything. He said PhD, grad students, uh, any level, uh, any, any, any level of education uh, will consider. Um, and like I said earlier, we have uh, an intern from last summer 
who they like so much, they gave him a job offer in November, he's graduating in the summer, the week later he's gonna come work for us on, on the team that I'm on. I'm on the uh, hydrogen fuel cell team, that's the name of my team. And we are gonna hire one intern this summer. I'm gonna throw the uh, name of the company on the board. Oh, yeah, actually. And while we're at it, I got a side uh, question uh, about uh, conditions for international students on uh, the internships, do you know? Anything about that? This this student in particular is a you know what? Student, but you have to know Sorry, I'm not a lecturer. <laughs> this is a little better. Uh, you know what? Uh, I honestly, I, I don't. I didn't even consider that. I'm very sorry. Uh, I didn't think about H1B for, type visa or employment. For your line of work, I, I don't think it would be a huge thing unless there's some sort of defense approach to the fuel cells that I'm not monitoring. Right. Uh, the, but for something like a defense. Uh, We actually have uh, a lot of people that I work with are not from the U.S. I don't know what their citizenship is. Uh, our CEO, the, the inventor of the thing that we're building, uh, is from India. Uh, a lot of our design works done in Bangalore, India. Uh, I, I don't know how that applies uh, to international students. You, whoever asked the question might know better than I do how internships work if you're not an American citizen. And I apologize for that. I, it didn't even occur to me to ask about that. I'll let them know to look, look down some Okay. Avenues, yeah. But back to the, the blue energy and, and internships in general about you're having a lot of students coming in. All right. And the website is bloomenergy.com. Uh, it is... We have a career uh, section on there. I know for sure that we have not put our internships on there yet. I think it's in a month or two but before we do. So what I asked uh, the director, one, is how big is the program? He said, well, he thinks last year they hired 60 interns. My team is hiring one. And my team leader said, if you meet anybody that you think would, like, uh, would, would uh, be good for our team, get their resume and pass it on. Um, the pay, these are paid internships. He, he was not sure about the exact pay, but he said it's in the neighborhood of $35 an hour. So don't quote me on that as an exact number, but it'll be around there. They're basically, you'll, you'll make enough money to live in San Jose, uh, still living in a room somewhere. It's a 10, it's a 10 week uh, process, uh, course, and not course, it's a 10 week job, and you can pick your start date. They're pretty flexible with that because you know, some schools are done in May, some are done in June. Uh, they're okay with that. Uh, I don't have any tips on how to get noticed, um, you know, amongst all the other resumes that will be floating around. Uh, I, I don't know how the other teams are going to uh, hire, but it seems like one to three, I guess, is normal. A a after three, it gets hard to manage a bunch of, uh, essentially you're a new hire with no experience. But the good thing is this. I asked my team leader about what the intern does for our team, and he said they're very hands-on. The intern on our team literally will be setting up tests and recording data. You'll actually learn what it's like to work as an engineer on an engineering team. They also don't worry about what your major is. I said, I asked him, well, what's the requirement? Do you have to be an actual engineering major? And he said, well, no, physics, chemistry electrical and mechanical there could be a spot somewhere so in the next month or two you know, keep an eye out there might uh, be some openings uh, and what i'll do also i um i'll ask uh, my boss again and remind him and i'll let uh, doug know hey we'll put the jobs up or here's a link to uh, the internship so if you want to live in the bay for two and a half months uh, and get an idea of what it's like uh, to work for an engineering company it's a pretty good company to work for they're the pay is pretty good I mean, 35 bucks an hour is more than I made in my first engineering job uh, out of college. The other thing about that too is you'll, you'll see a lot of times uh, employers will be like, you graduate and they'll be like, internships are a bonus. And there's a reason why. It's not just that you're getting some experience, um, like in my, in my case, designing a circuit. It's actually uh, document control. Um, how, how you navigate a company network and know where to go to find things. It's about understanding the life cycle of a product from concept to end of life. Uh, these are all things that uh, you don't really, it, it might be mentioned in passing, but it's not really focused on in school. 
but they're things that like they're like ah oh, I gotta teach this person this too you know kind of thing the more you, the more you learn before you go to the workforce the better it's less they gotta teach you um, I'm just gonna go ahead and jump in we're coming up on the one hour mark we're about 55 minutes um, Jason has generously offered to just stay and answer yeah. questions as long as people have them uh, but I also don't want people who have other things to do who've only budgeted an hour to get held up so if it's okay with you if, if people filter out sure. one by yeah. one on their own um, so we're not ending the talk. We just want to say thank you for coming. For every, everybody say thank you for coming. Thanks. And then anybody who needs to leave can just quietly leave on their own. But anybody who has more questions, please just keep. Right. This is better than 20 classes combined for your experience. So please keep, keep coming up with questions and asking. Uh, something else, uh, I don't want to give out my personal or work email uh, on the video. Um, but if you are interested in um, applying for an internship, it's in San Jose. I haven't really figured this out yet, but maybe he can make an announcement in class about how we'll do this. But there'll be a way to get me your resume. And then I can pass it on to uh, my boss. You know, and my boss's boss, who could actually spread it around. How about the interview process? You guys want to hear about how, how it is to interview for a company? Okay. So... When I was in your position and somebody came and talked to me and they said, you know, there's 10 engineering jobs for every engineer in the US. There are so many jobs, they'll be throwing money at you trying to get you to come to their company. When I graduated, it took me 16 months to find a job. And I was looking basically in just Sacramento area, but also uh, I blanched out a little bit, but I already thought in my head, I don't want to work in the Bay. I hate traffic. I hate crowds. Sacramento is the max I want to do. I don't want to go anything beyond Sacramento. And yeah, it took me like 16 months to find a job in the Sacramento area. Um, I had my resume. I, I explained earlier how I kind of edited it down so that it didn't look so uh, full of unnecessary work. So let's just, let's just skip to uh, the part where they call me, right? So I, I submit my resume. I su submit my cover letter. And I get an email or a phone call. It's typically from somebody in HR or some sort of admin position. It's not necessarily an engineer or a tech person. And they will say, hey, we saw your uh, resume. Uh, we think you'd be a good fit for our company as a uh, um, entry level position. Uh, and then they, they might fill me out a little bit like, you know, when did you graduate? Uh, that might be on my resume. But they want to make small talk, see how I am as a person. You know, like, what's your experience so far? How'd you like school? That kind of stuff. They might uh, ask you to explain yourself a little bit, what you like as a person. You know, they're not really going to get into the tech stuff. One, they probably don't know the tech side of things. They just know your resume and they just want to kind of see if they should recommend that you be passed on to the next, the next step. Sometimes it'll be a tech person and they'll want to talk to you like right away. But you get that first phone call and it's, it'll be an uh, like in house recruiter, right? So then they'll say, well, you know what? I want to pass you on to our lead recruiter or our lead HR person uh, to see if you'll be a good fit in our company. Great. And they're like, well, when do you want to do this? And I said, well, I'm open. Uh, so anytime. So we set a day and a time and they'll call me. They call me. You don't call them. They call you. They, when it's set up, they'll call you. So this next person may not be a tech person either. It, it, it's kind of like it could go either way. It's one non-tech person or it could be back to back. But once you get, get, get past that part, it's going to be technical questions. So that's, this point right here is when they might ask you, what is your salary expectation? You're probably applying for a job where you live, maybe. Sometimes you might want to move to another city. So you want to be aware of what, what, what is the rent and where you're living at? How much does it cost to live there? Don't be shy about asking for more than you think you're worth because they'll still make you an offer if they like you. Um, I was a little shy about um, asking. I thought I was asking for more than I was worth. And they, they actually exceeded my, what I was asking, which is nice of them. Uh, they, um, once you get through that part, they really want to know the money. They want to know if you're a nice person. If you get along with the team, they'll say, you know what? We want to pass you on to the team leader for the team we want, we think you could interview for on this, this, this position. And when's a good time? Uh, at this point, they already know when he's available, the team leader is available. He, he, he is my boss. I have a boss. Is a he? So I, I didn't pick he because I'm 
you know, in inconsiderate, I guess. So uh, he had a time that was available, and so did I, and, and uh, he called me on the Zoom. It was a Zoom call, and it was about an hour-long um, conversation. And this is my second job, uh, and this is how you know that it's a good interview once you've been in the workforce for a little while. The less they talk, the better. The more you talk, the better, as long as you know what you're talking about. So they'll, they'll steal the conversation. They'll be like, oh, what did you work on when you were over there? And they want to hear you saying the right lingo. Uh, they want to hear that you solved a problem. How did you solve it? What steps did you take? Where did you fail? Every single person in the world failed at some point. All right, so y y they know that you failed. You know, they failed in school. They failed uh, in their job. They made a mistake somewhere. They don't, th you don't have to sell yourself on being the perfect person. You know, you learn from a mistake, you know. So this was basically an hour long conversation of just me talking with him interjecting every once in a while. That's a good interview once you're an experienced engineer. When you're not, um, you can let them steer it more. They understand. They've been there. They've been a first year hire. They understand what it's like. I'll get into that one too. Uh, so after that interview was over, I get an email the next day from the lead recruiter and it says, hi, you know, team leader really liked you a lot. We would like you to come in and meet us in person. Uh, what is a good date for you to come in? And so we set a date and a time and they said, it's going to be like a panel interview. There'll be three or four people. It'll be over uh, three or four hours. So, okay. So uh, we go in. It wasn't quite a panel interview, but it kind of was. And this is actually something you can expect too. So you go in and it was like 9 a.m. And person one comes in, director of engineering. 45 minutes just talking back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Same questions. What kind of problems did you solve? What did you work on? Um, you know, what was... Uh, what was a mistake you made that you learned from? Um, he leaves the room. Person two comes in. He's the team leader on the team parallel to mine. He starts asking me questions too, like, you know, what did you work on? Um, they also start trying to sell you on the company. They'll say, here's what we do. Here's what we're working on. This is something that you might get to work on too someday. You know, they'll start doing that too. If they're selling you on the company, it's a good sign. You know, because they, uh, that means they want you to be excited about what they're excited about. So yeah, it was four people. One of the people was a Zoom interview from Delaware. We have a location in Delaware. And he was a supply chain person. I, somebody else canceled last minute. So this person stepped in and asked me some questions. And again, it was just to get a feel for me. Who's he as a person? Because I already, I already hit the interview with the team leader. They, yeah, we want to hire him. Let's see how he is as a person with four other people. You know, we get along with everybody else. So uh, that's basically how the interview goes once you're in. The um, struggle I had uh, with my first job was I was nervous. I, was, I, I, I built up the pressure like, oh, I, I got to nail this interview. I bombed some of the most basic questions. Uh, you're electrical, right? Okay, here's an example of a question, right? You're electrical, yeah. Oh, who's, you're electrical. Oh, that's right, sorry. Uh, so I was interviewing with an aerospace company near Yosemite, and I was really studying, like, I looked up the, their products and I was, thought I knew what they were gonna ask me. It turns out that what they're gonna ask you are things that you should know from school. They're not gonna try and trip you up on something that they do. It's like going to this interview with uh, all this, like, unnecessary information, and, I was asked a very easy question that I should know. He said, how does an inductor work? And I blinked. It's one of the most basic components in electronics as an inductor. You should know how it works. And I did not. Uh, I bombed the interview. The only question I got right was um, what kind of uh, resistor or what rating, what power rating should this resistor have for this power output? You know, and they gave me like a, a voltage and a, and a current output. I had to solve for it. That'll come later. You'll figure it out later. You'll know what that means. But for now, it was basically very simple questions that you learn in your first circuits class. And I did terribly because I was uh, so nervous and, and I just, my mind went blank when I was like, he didn't ask me about control systems. He's asking me about an inductor. And I, I froze. Uh, 
they're not trying to, to trick you up. They're not trying to get you to fail. They just want to see, oh, they learn the stuff they're supposed to learn in school. That's that transitions nicely back to, um, we got a couple questions on the Zoom uh, about kind of earlier in the process, the related questions, so I'm gonna mush them together into one. Okay. Were there times in school you thought about quitting? Yes. And <laughs> is it normal to not completely enjoy all your classes and still end up loving your job? Yes, okay. okay. So two very Yeah, things. yeah, yes to both. So, okay, for me it might be a little different because I'm older and in a sense this was almost like a moonshot I was going back to school, I drained my savings, uh, paying for tuition, buying books, buying uh, the um, equipment that you need. If you're going into electrical, you may have to buy um, a lot of little components, electronics kind of stuff that you need to use for later on. Uh, there were a few times where I would have panic attacks, where I thought I should stop now before I get into more debt. I, I'm wasting my time. No one's going to hire a 40 year old engineer. Uh, I did have that. And then I'd go to bed and I wake up in the morning and I get back on the grind. I go to school, do the whole thing. Um, the second question was, did I not, did I enjoy all my classes? Overall, I enjoyed all of my classes and all of my instructors. I never had one instructor here or at Sac State that I did not like. There were a few times where, in math, where we were learning something, and in my mind, I thought, I'm never going to need to know this for electrical engineering. I'm just going to kind of, you know, leave it alone, and I'll work on something else. She smiled when you said in math, by the way. Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> it turns out, if you're going to electrical engineering, almost every single thing you learn in calculus, you have to know in electrical engineering, in school. You, uh, I don't want to get into all the different things you got to know, but almost everything you learn is applied in a class call. It might be called something like signals and linear systems or something like that. You pretty much have to use all that stuff for that class and some other classes too. Um, it's, uh, it was an eye opener for me. I had to go back and review some stuff that I kind of ignored. You know, I have to use the restroom. Uh, oh, can yes, we can we absolutely. break? Uh, Just for. Is the Mic thing on me, you can just clip it, un unclip it, front, say, yeah, you, you Can everybody online hear me speaking? Anybody talk in the chat or say something? Okay, cool, they can. All right, so uh, again, if you need to leave, please go ahead. Uh, you guys have already done your time here. Um, but I think the last piece of the puzzle, uh, we've had a great talk, and you guys are, are sitting through it patiently very nicely. The last piece of the puzzle is for you guys to go ahead and just share your experiences and challenges, or not necessarily yours, but ones that you think are coming, or ones that your friends have faced. It's related to that last question about times you, you thought you're going to quit. Um, that's what's coming for you guys in the next two, three years. And, and that's the moment that people either give out or say, hey, he pulled it off. Maybe I can do it. Like you said, get up and go to the grind one more day. Right? Um, I put it in the syllabus. I, I give a little speech at the beginning of class. The most important thing you can have here is not being a genius. It's keep going. You're going to fail something. You're going to mess something up. I see super talented students come in here all the time. They ace the first six weeks of class, and then the hard thing comes. And they go, oh, I'm not good at this. And, and, they, and, they, and, they, and they, I never see them again. And I say, how did that person quit? They're so talented. It doesn't make any sense, right? Um, so that is, I think, the, the biggest message here. And um, just, just show of hands, how many have more questions for Jason uh, versus want to hang out? Okay, and then I think there's a few people on the Zoom that look like they wanted to stick around as well. Again, feel free to go if you need to, um, but if you have more questions along those lines, that I think is going to be the last line of questioning for these last you know, 15, 20 minutes when he's here. So when he comes back, we'll, we'll go that route. Um, 
people on Zoom, I'm going to come back around behind the camera, so there's going to be a blank screen here, and I'll see if anybody typed anything relevant to that nature. Just moment. Yes? How did you want to submit the reflections? Uh, I think I said in the assignment, I think it's just two paragraphs. So I think, I think in Canvas, it's just an open assignment, so you can submit a PDF, or you, uh, you know what, I didn't actually, I will format that. In fact, I'm going to do that right now while we're talking about it. Uh, um, I don't, I don't remember how I had it set up. I just opened it. So I would say either PDF. Um, there's a way to just type it directly into Canvas. The text box will open. That's fine. Those are my two favorite options. So I'm going to just set those up right now. Uh, thank you for, for asking that question. And do we just say that if, if, if we were in person or online? Um, I've got attendance taken for each, so I've written every wrote their name on the paper, right? Who's here? Cool. And everybody who's on Zoom, I wrote all your names down earlier, so you should be in good shape. Um, let me set up uh, the question earlier for those on Zoom was how do we submit the Canvas assignment online? And the answer is going to be a PDF or typing into the text box. I'm going to set that up right now. Uh, Jason is back, so anybody who has more questions, feel free. Uh, Zoom people, I'll be right back to look at your chat in just a moment. This is dude's next. No, I think it's in a few days or something like that. I, I give you plenty of time to write it up. Uh, can you guys hear me again? So I'll make sure that. Uh, uh, let, me plug, let me plug that back in. Hold on, hold on. And. Where did it go? There it is. And that goes into the microphone spot. All right, so can you hear me? Is that coming through? So I, I want to kind of flesh out the uh, whether or not you enjoy all your classes. Oh, we're good? Yeah. Okay, so when it comes to, um, you know, should you enjoy all your classes or did I enjoy all my classes? No. Um, not because I didn't like the material, uh, but there were times where the, the work seemed overwhelming uh, to the point where I almost just wanted to freeze and just not do it, but then you, you kind of just got to make yourself do one step at a time and get through it. You're not going to like everything you do. Uh, when you go into the uh, professional field of science uh, or, or engineering or research, whatever you're going to do, you're not going to like everything you do, but you are probably going to like um, the general projects and, and what you're working on. So like I'm working on green energy, I'm working on hydrogen fuel cells, I'm working on the energy of the future. I love it, but there are some times where I get up in the morning and I log on and I work from home sometimes. So when I say get up in the morning, uh, I might have 38 emails and I read through them and I'm just like, okay, what am I reading now? What am I reading now? What am I reading now? And there are some times where, yeah, I'm just, I'm just tired. You know, that, that's normal. That's human, that's human nature. Uh, in the end, it's worth it uh, for me. I knew what I wanted to do. I went to school. Uh, some of the classes were like, okay, they were fine. I loved all my instructors. I loved most of the material that I studied. Honestly, there was something kind of neat about bragging about being in a science or engineering based major. You do kind of feel a little better. Yeah, I, I hate to say it that way, you know, but you know, I, I, I liked the looks I got when I said electrical engineering. Yeah, I liked it. Uh, when I moved, you can say we're better than everybody else. Okay, all right, great. Uh, when I when I moved to the when I moved to Fremont, I learned by day two that nobody cares that you're an engineer because they're all engineers. <laughs> but it was cool for a while when I was living in Sacramento. So uh, yeah, it was. Uh, um, it's I think in the end, the the parts of classes I did not like uh, were it was worth it. Uh, it, it was worth it to, to go through the work because for the most part, I liked everything. Uh, I was in control systems. Uh, to me, it was a very tangible product, uh, uh, what I was learning. I was building robots and feedback systems that did neat things. And, and uh, my senior design thesis was you know, robot-based and, and I thought I was gonna build robots you know, um, after school, after college. Um, but what I'm doing now, what I like about it is that I, in some small way, I have a direct effect on the well-being of people. It's something that I, I, I like that. That's, it's a good feeling for me. So that's part of what motivates me to keep doing it. 
may not be so small yeah. fuel cell technology. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, any more questions? Yeah. Um, this one's a little unrelated, but in your STEM career or just um, where you stand now, mm -hmm. do you notice an increase or a good ratio to women and men? That's a very good question. Um, I'll start with this. Um, when I went back to school, I made it a point to form a study group with the smartest people in the class. They were all women. Um, one is now getting her PhD at UC Irvine. She's a visiting researcher at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory up in uh, UC Berkeley. Another uh, went to um, oh, Cornell to study astronomy. You know, Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, probably the most famous place to study astronomy in the world, I guess. Uh, another um, went to UCSB, got a degree in chemical engineering, and just two weeks ago was presenting at MIT. So uh, that was my study group, uh, and I was the dumbest one in the group. I think I have a theory about this. Um, Guys tend to be really headstrong and yeah, we're gonna do it no matter what. In general, um, maybe uh, that could be a little intimidating to um, women or girls sometimes or uh, other genders. Um, so you usually tend to find the smartest people in the class are usually the girls because they were the best in their math and the best in their science, and they're going to go into science. Whereas the guys, it's not always the case. You know, uh, I'm not saying anyone here is dumb. I'm just, I'm just saying that like we'll say we're going to do it because we can, you know, kind of thing, and that we don't, we don't overthink things about like maybe I'm not good enough, you know. And I think there's a sort of integrity there that that a girl might have that a guy might not have um, about going into uh, uh, engineering. Where I'm at right now. There is one woman on my team. She's from India. She's super smart. She's brilliant. Um, she is a systems engineer, and I'm going to be working with her this year on a new project that she's working on that is so neat and cool. I can't talk about it because it's proprietary. It can't be, it can't be made public. So I wish I could. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, uh, yeah. I, I'll butt in here with, um, in terms of opportunity, uh, and, yeah. and you know, I'm stuck in this academic world where there's no applications and no jobs and all that kind of stuff, right? But um, in, in academia and in educational opportunities, I think is a little, a couple of years ahead of industry right now in terms of aggressively carving out opportunities for women. So you're going to find, um, especially in the sciences and, and, and engineering, a lot of schools aggressively trying to have X percent of their class mm -hmm. women. Um, I went to an undergraduate school called Harvey Mudd College. When I went there, it was 80% male. It is currently 55% female. So in a 20 year period, they were able to aggressively implement policies to make that happen. Um, it's also happening in the professional world, uh, but slower. Uh, by the time you're looking for jobs, you're probably going to get companies fighting over you the way that they're fighting over uh, you for summer internships now. It's like, oh, we've got, mm -hmm. we've got a girl who wants to do this stuff and she's good at it. Six different you know, people fighting for it. So um, it, it, it's coming and you're at a good time uh, to have it happen. Um, it's sad that it's taking this long uh, and, and there are, are all kinds of other societal factors that, that have led to the percentages being what they are. They're slowly changing, but they're changing. Uh, yeah, I hope I didn't say anything to put any of the female students off. Um, quite the contrary. So, um, well, no, I mean, yeah. You're honest about your experience. Yeah. When you're doing interviews, he came to interview. He yeah, and I, was, I, was, I, I actually was trying to make it a point uh, in my head before I came here to say they, them. Um, but the thing is, I talk to a he. I talk to that's yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's related. Exactly yeah, and, and we're in this transition period yeah. between what actually happened in your personal experience versus the way the world is trying to set itself right. up for the future, and it doesn't happen overnight. So the, the director of the the director of mechanical engineering at Bloom is a woman. Uh, I met her my first week, oddly enough, because. Uh, we have these acronyms and, and, and abbreviations for our, our work locations. There's like six or seven locations around the bay that, that are, are blooms. And one of them is called um, BMCC. 
And I was in my first week orientation and I asked the uh, person running the orientation, what does BMCC mean? Because I'm going to be there a lot, you know? And uh, this person was like, I don't, I don't know. And like nobody knew. And so I'm, I'm back in my cubicle and um, uh, the director of engineering comes by and, and I said, hey, what does BMCC stand for? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> You know, and then somebody else walked by. It was the uh, this woman. She was director of mechanical engineering, and they said, "Hey, what's what's what does BMCC mean?" Like six of us were all engineers, and we didn't know what BMCC meant. And then my team leader um, said, "Well, BMCD is Bloom Manufacturing Center, Delaware," and uh, not one of us made the connection yet that BMCC was Bloom Manufacturing Center, California. Uh, and then finally I said, is it California? And they were like, oh, okay, yeah, that's what it was. But yeah, there, uh, there was on the floor where my office is, or my cubicle, I think there are a couple hundred people on that floor. I I'm hardly ever there. I would say like 15 to 20% are women. Um, a lot of those jobs though are work from home now, so they, I, I don't really know everybody that works there. When I'm out in the field, and when I say field, I'm at a different location than corporate. Uh, the, I would say, yeah, about 15% are women there too. There's a really neat uh, team called NPI uh, at Bloom Energy. They um, basically design and build the things that we used to build our stuff or test our stuff because it's so new. There, there is no machine that can test our product because our product is so new. They design and they build it and there's like two women on that team. And there are, one's a mechanical, one's an electrical. And they write programs and they do the calculations and they build these really neat machines that are automated that will pick up this giant thousand pound thing that generates you know, a kilowatt of energy or whatever it does and will do all these tests on it. They built that. And so there's, you'll, I would say, right, yeah, about 15 to 20% you'll see are women or non-binary. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in industry, that's, that, that's typical. Yeah. In academia, you're probably talking more like 30 to 40% and increasing fast. Um, the biggest trap I've seen students fall in from my um, experience is exactly what Jason talked about is the imposter syndrome. And being a female, happen to be in a study group with six males, it, it creeps up and it hits you that I feel different, I feel like I don't belong here. And, and that's yeah. where it really needs to, you know, the, the steel needs to come in and say, yes, I belong here, yes, I'm, I want to do this. And uh, yeah, I, it's. It's something that needs to start at a lower level than college, but we can only work with where we are right now. And, uh, and, and that's, that, that's just my advice. Yep. How about, how about learning about what it's like in a typical day in a job as an, as an engineer? I can speak it as an engineer. Because I, when I was where you, you guys were at, I asked that question um, several times with different people who talked, and I always got the same variation of it depends and I, that didn't really satisfy me, my, my curiosity. So I thought about telling you about something that happened to me uh, that makes power electronics. Uh, my division was in high voltage, low power, and we, we made things that were used in medical devices. They were they're used to power uh, what's called an E-chuck, which is like this, this electric arm that picks up silicon wafers for semiconductor manu manufacturing for computer chips. And these were DC to DC step up power converters was a big part of our business. And my job title was test engineer. My job was to test these products against our advertised spec uh, online that our clients would see. And they go, oh, we want to buy that because it says it does this. And I got to make sure it does that, you know, before we actually release it to manufacturing and production. And Part of my job, this is an R&D by the way, that was, uh, this location was an R&D facility. Part of my job also meant supporting manufacturing which was overseas in Vietnam. So this one day I come into work and I'm in the middle of running a test and this test is to make sure that this product that basically fits in the palm of your hand, it puts out 3,000 volts of electricity uh, but only 30 watts. You'll learn what that means uh, next year. And it's, it's actually not that bad. <laughs> uh, and I was testing against a data sheet. And this is a, something we had on our company website that people could look at and see what does it do. And I had to make sure it does these things uh, with, with some margin. And so I'm going in to run this test. But here's what I, I get in around 7, 7.30 in the morning. It depends on where you work at. Some jobs are later. 
I chose to get one earlier because on Mondays, we always had an 8.30 team meeting. And I wanted to get in early, have coffee, and answer my emails because you got every morning, you got to answer your emails. And so I go in, get coffee, talk to my boss, we're kind of hanging out and goofing around stuff. And then I go in uh, to the lab and I kind of migrated my office from my cubicle to the lab because I was always in the lab all the time. So I go on, uh, 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 I log on, I check my emails. Vietnam sent an email, hey, we have a problem uh, with this product. It's failing at these low input voltages. I'll try not to get into too much detail about what it does, but uh, so I said, okay. So I, I read the problem. He sent me some, uh, he, it was a he again, sent me uh, these test results and I was reading all the test results. I'm like, okay, I think I've handled what the, what the problem is. Now I gotta figure out the solution. Got some more emails. There was two other issues uh, that I had as well. All right, so re read through all my emails and at 8.30 we have a uh, team meeting. And the team meeting for the week is, where are we in our current projects? Here's what's coming up down the pipe. Get this in your head, here's what we're thinking about. Start planning ahead about what you're gonna do for this next project. Once that's done, okay, what are you working on? Okay, what's going on today with Vietnam? What's going on today with whatever? So I tell my boss, okay, well, I'm doing this test uh, to make sure that we pass what's called an SVT or specification verification test. It means, does it pass our specs? Uh, I, I, I'll be done this week, probably Thursday. I uh, got an email from Vietnam. Here's the problem with this other, uh, other, uh, um, other product and they can't go to production until it's fixed. Uh, we also have two other problems. There's a client who's um, you know, testing one of our products and it's failing here. And there's also an issue with design engineer on the East Coast for something I tested for. He, my boss will then triage for me what's most important. And production is always more important than anything else. So Vietnam is the priority for production. Then it's uh, answer the, well, actually, because the other two problems were really easy to fix, those two problems, then it was um, fix production issue and then go back to testing. So it, I, I answered back to the client. It was a really simple problem they had. Then I answered back to the design engineer. It was basically something I was testing and he had a question about how I did the test. And so I ha handled that and then uh, spent the rest of the day trying to recreate the problem that Vietnam had. And I couldn't do it. The same product that I had that they had, I had at my place was passing. It turns out after a day and a half of testing, it turns out the problem was not the unit itself. The problem was the voltage coming from the walls. It turns out that because in the US there's 120 volt, 60 hertz uh, 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 power coming through the wall. In Vietnam it's 50 hertz and 240. Uh, that was causing an issue at low voltages. So I figured that out, which basically meant can't do anything about it. That's just the way it is. You know? So uh, I messaged them back and said, hey, when this happens, you, gotta, you have to move from this testing apparatus and try it on this testing apparatus. It'll filter out this issue. So, all right, it's fixed, but it's not a good fix. Okay, so back to testing. Uh, that's a typical day. Answer emails, um, design a test, run a test, test a product, um, uh, stop testing, fix a problem somewhere else, go back to testing. So when someone says it depends, it's true, it does depend because the next week, it could be a completely different thing I'm working on. And I may have to do research. One of the cool things about working professionally is this. So when you're in school, uh, you have like, what, 16, 20 hours a week of, of being in class, right? And you get home, you got homework. You're probably putting in 60, 70 hours a week, right? Uh, when you're uh, working in the professional field, you, do, you work 40 hours a week, maybe 50. You got free time and disposable income. You can relax get a massage, buy a car, it's, it's fun. <laughs> well, thing yeah. that, um, like I mentioned earlier, out of high school I did start working for like, I mean, just kind of like assembly certain things for the electrical, or they were working on semiconductors uh -huh. and I would watch the engineers and it was amazing because basically what you said is all I would see them do. And put it on your resume, make sure it's on there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the mornings, uh, mornings, meetings and stuff yeah. and then in the afternoon start working and then I'd see them go off for like a month to Japan, I think, to fix the machine and then right. come back. And yeah. It's kind of like every, everything you said, it was, uh, like I was able to see it. So it it's it's kind of interesting too, like where, where I'm at right now, um, I asked my boss if there was a lot of travel involved and he said, do you want to travel? 
Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, okay, sure. Because there are some people that don't. They have families. I, I don't have a family. I don't have any kids. I'm single. I can go to India. Uh, a lot of the people that work there don't. They have soccer practice. You know, they've got you know two kids. Their wife uh, is working also. You know, they can't they can't go to Delaware for two weeks. You know, I can. You know, so it's kind of a a good experience for me. You know, and it's yeah, it's fun. Into diapers real quick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's a choice. Right. That's, right. I'm trying to. You know, I thought I think I had something else I was going to talk about, and I can't remember what it was. Um, are there any, any more questions? I want to answer everything. I want to have like a free flowing conversation if we can too. The one thing I wanted to ask yeah. you when I was at that company, um, I did see them promote a woman, and this was, I mean, this was back in like 2013, 2014. They were, they, right. She, and she wasn't even an engineer, but they put her like in a ma she was able to manage. In a management in engineering position, yeah. Like specifically chose her over other engineers even. You know, I, I came across this at my, my first job, and this is, not, this is nothing negative about my, my first job. It was a great company to work for. But I did see a tendency for the female engineers to gravitate towards these like management positions. Uh, not what I, what I mean by it's not negative is that these were like project management. It was like they were they were less hands on and less calculate calculating stuff. They were more like uh, basically uh, running spreadsheets of like you know deadlines, you know kind of thing. They they were not being an engineer. They went to school for it, and then when they got out, they kind of got placed in this role of managing teams deadlines like yeah pretty pretty that's, much yeah yeah and, and that's a lot of yeah. the stigma that, that is still sticking around industry um uh it's still moving in the right direction it's just moving slower um academia tend to ha have a little bit more organized and, and like i said aggressive policies to kind of break that kind of stuff but but yeah that, that that's right. what i hear anecdotally a lot trying to electrical anything for electrical you want to ask how does an inductor work? I, I was yeah, <laughs> I, I was excited when I heard electrical engineering. What, what's your major? Electrical. Are you nice? All right, good. Two. I got two. Okay. Oh, you know what? Let let me get a little bit more into um, senior your senior year. I'm, I'm, I'm in. I'm transferring. This is my last. Okay. Yeah. So when you every electrical and computer and mechanical engineer is going to have a similar uh, class series called something like senior design thesis or senior project or whatever and you're gonna find a societal problem and develop design and build an engineering solution and if you have a really good advisor you're gonna be writing a lot and you're gonna be in this lab a lot you're gonna be sleeping in a lab I used to call it the stress sweats because like, like by the end of the semester by the end of your last semester you're just trying to make this thing work you know, uh, and it's uh, it's stressful. It's tiring. It stinks. Like literally, the room smells because everyone's in there trying to get stuff done. <laughs> uh, just be prepared for it. It's not. It's actually not that big of a deal because there are. I put too much pressure on myself to do this. I was worried about um, not finding a good project to work on. It, it, it was just kind of just luck. I, w I took up gardening that summer before my fall semester, and it was literally the Friday before school started, and I'm sitting out in my garden watching the bees pollinate the uh, pepper plants. And uh, I thought about this quote that was attributed to Albert Einstein, which, by the way, he did not say it. Einstein did not say this, but he was credited with saying it, which was, if it were not for the honeybee, mankind dies off in like, I was like two years or five years or whatever, yeah, that, yeah. Uh, and I was like, Eureka, I'm going to design a robot that does what bees do. Have you not seen yeah. the Black Mirror? No, is there an episode about yeah. that? About, about, about pollination? About bees, somebody makes bees that pollinate. Oh yeah, okay, and, 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 and actually, I wanna get into also how you can make it easier on yourself. Um, so in my mind, I thought I'm gonna get, get some drones and I'm gonna program them to grab pollen from one flower and put it in another, you know? And I was on this chat group with a bunch of recent graduates uh, from Sac State, and I was like, hey guys, I got an idea for this uh, project. What do you guys think? And the very first answer uh, that someone got back to was, stay away from drones. And the reason why is the precision. Uh, think about uh, a bee 
approaching a flower and it's windy out. So you're doing this, you know, trying to, to get the, collect the pollen. Uh, think about how long a battery will stay active and charged uh, on a drone. Like what, seven minutes, eight minutes. You might be able to successfully address one flower and then it dies. You know, you gotta you know, recharge it, you know. Um, all that stuff gets taken into account. Then, uh, somebody else said, you know what, maybe you could do it this way. I, I actually was networking. I was asking former students, what do you think about this? How should I go about doing it? So then I decided, okay, a wheeled robot and I'll just go with that. So I go into this meeting with our advisor and I'm like, hey, here's my idea. A robot that pollinates plants. And he just kind of deadpan being like, why don't you find something easier? You know, uh, it immediately just shot down everything that uh, I thought about, like, uh, you know, farming and, and we're going to like, you know, take pollen from one flower and put it into another one. You know, he, he goes, then he said, why don't you, why don't you research how bees pollinate first? Come back next week with an, uh, an idea for a project that you want to do, um, but put some good faith effort into um, this project and see if it's going to work for you. And, about, and by the way, I had a team of like five, five people, me included. Typically four is about the size, four to five people. For you electricals, make sure you recruit a computer engineer because they can handle the programming. You don't want to do the programming. Let them handle, it. Let them handle all, the, all the scripts. Um, so we each had our own idea. We presented like the five ideas that we had for our team. We still like the, the pollinating one the best, and, but we, we looked into how does a bee work, how does this work. That's why we discovered self-pollination, that there's actually plants that pollinate themselves, but they need wind or water or something to uh, um, knock the pollen loose, you know? So the next week we go back and I felt like I had a really strong argument for this pollinating robot and it was that we're going to use a strawberry plant that it's self-pollinating and it's low to the ground so we don't have to worry about like damaging it and all this kind of stuff but right when I walk in my teacher said please tell me you stuck with the robot that pollinates plants and I said I did our whole team wants to do it you know here's why he's like good a good advisor is going to challenge you the reason why he did this to to us as a team is because our attitude was we're going to build a robot and that was it uh, when you're in the real world, there is a, like a, a marketing uh, step in the life cycle of a project. Is there a market for this? You know, will people want to buy it? Step two, is it feasible? Can you actually get, the, can, can our team, are we qualified to build this and get it done? You know, can, uh, will it work once we get it assembled? But all this stuff goes in, he was just challenging us to like think like an engineer. Um, what's it going to cost? It costs the, the whole project cost us about five thousand dollars. Does that come out of your pocket? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you can get you can you can get sponsorships. It's possible to get sponsorships. So we each spent over the course of that year, we each spent a thousand dollars. About a little less. It's a little less than that. Example of a sponsorship. So um, there's a team of, of, of electricals that had a really neat project. I was really jealous of them. They could, that they could even do it. I couldn't do it. They were uh, RF engineers, majors. So there's, if you go into electrical, you, there's power, there's controls, there's RF. RF is like radio signals. And they were trying to come up with a way to communicate across different frequencies. So apparently uh, you can, if you're on different frequencies, you can hear them, but you cannot, talk to them, if that makes sense. You're not really communicating directly. It's an issue in the military. Um, God, who was the... Uh, Northrop Grumman sponsored them. Northrop Grumman gave them the use of eight engineers, uh, and they actually had a facility on their campus in Sacramento that let them uh, test telecommunications. It was like this, this big dome that kept out every uh, signal and prevented their signals from interfering with the <laughs> civilian population. So apparently yeah, that was gonna be an issue. Yeah, this is a sex state. This is, yeah. this is a Cal State. I mean, yeah. There, there's stuff right. out there that you can work with. Exactly. Um, I don't know how you, you could actually answer this better than I could. Uh, if there are, is access to labs and equipment at UCSB uh, to, for undergrads, like outside of just your class? Uh, yes, but it's gotta be, you know, faculty sponsored or, or, or chaperoned or whatever. Uh, oh, someone's got to be there. 
to my to my understanding, that's that's the current thing. I I okay. haven't been involved in that in quite some time, so yeah, right. I'm not okay. really sure what the, what the um, there, there's probably some open labs as well. Right. Certainly for computer coding. Oh sure, yeah, okay. So I, I can't speak for every school, but I know at, at Sac State, uh, one of the first things I did, did when I got there was I signed up for a key fob. It gave me 24 seven access to the engineering building. I could walk in at 1 a.m. and there were three labs I could walk into. I could unlock the door with my key fob and I can start working. So uh, you have this like three or four hour lab where you get to build a circuit and then you're gonna test it and all this kind of stuff. But sometimes you've got so much schoolwork you gotta get done you go in for the lab, just get the quick rundown, build everything, and you leave. I got, I got a final or, a, or a, I got an exam tomorrow or a meeting I'm going to study for. Then I come back later at like 10 p.m. And I go into this lab and I'm there until 3 in the morning because they let me. They give me the extra time outside of, outside of the actual class hours uh, to use the equipment and get my schoolwork done when it's convenient for me. I don't know if every school does that. I, I would assume they do, but you actually do get, I, I heard this, I don't know if it's true, but CSUs do tend to be more hands-on than UCs. I don't know if that's really true or not. I've, I've heard that. I can't really confirm it. So it's a neat thing for that to consider. Anybody else? All right, guys, we're, we're hitting the hour and 40 mark, to be honest. I'll All right. That, that but if anybody has anything else you want to ask, you can save me. Please do it. Then, uh, you can uh, put questions uh, on uh, the YouTube video and I will try to answer them. Uh, I'll try to remember to check that out. And I'll discuss with Doug how to uh, get you involved with the, the internship thing. Yeah. Okay. One more time, guys. Let's thank Jason. All right. Thank you guys for Thank you guys. There. Thank you. You're the reason we're doing this. I appreciate you guys actually coming in person. I like that. It's easier to, to bounce off people and talk. Yeah. <laughs>